all for joining us today for this Donor Box Academy Memory Fox webinar. My name is Jenna, and I am the Education and Community Engagement Manager at Donor Box, and I'm just going to be your host today, which is just the most thing, most fun thing ever. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar, Donor Box is a platform that makes fundraising easy and secure for nonprofits. We offer simple, effective, and budget-friendly tools to help organizations manage their fundraising efforts and build stronger connections with their supporters. That's what we're all about today. So from our attractive, embeddable donation forms to our robust donor relationship management capabilities built to empower full meaning connections between you and your donors, DonorBox works for and with you as you establish grow and sustain your nonprofit, meeting your needs at each and every stage. So far, we've helped more than 80,000 organizations from all around the world raise over $2 billion in donations. So to learn more about us, you can visit us on our website at donorbox.org. And again, I am so excited to introduce someone that I deeply admire, Natalie Monroe, Community Engagement Manager at Memory Fox. And Memory Fox is a technology platform built specifically for nonprofits to collect, organize, and share impactful stories from their community. Memory Fox is a veteran-owned organization in Buffalo, New York. Go Bills! But they have an incredible team located all across the country. Uh, they believe in, that every nonprofit has a great story to tell, right? And they really relish the opportunity to help bring missions to life through video, photo, and written testimonials. So you can learn more about Memory Fox today, of course, um, but also at memoryfox.io. Without further ado, I'm gonna go behind the scenes. I'm gonna let Natalie share her screen. So everybody welcome Natalie. Thank you so much, Jenna, for the wonderful, warm welcome. Uh, I had so much fun last fall getting to join you for that Ask Me Anything we did together and even better to be back now today for round two. Um, like you said, I sit in a, a team full of Bills fans from Buffalo, but I have to hold on strong to my 49ers. So <laughs> as we dive in, um, I just want to start, start off by saying thank you. I know time is so valuable. So thank you, everybody, especially giving, given all these appeals you have going on, galas, events, everything that everybody's hosting. Thank you for taking an hour out of your day to be present here together to learn and grow around um, visual storytelling and 360 degree stewardship. And I hope that really this next hour together is just a moment for us to disconnect and um, spend time learning and growing. And um, I will tell you that part of this session will be somewhat interactive as we start to do some workshopping of ideas together. I'll let you all know, I'll give you the heads up when we get to that point in the presentation. Um, but for now, I wanna start us off and say, if someone asks, what is your mission? Can you show them? I think we're really good at being able to share in words through our mission statement, through our values, what our mission is. But can you show somebody um, what your mission looks like, what your work looks like? And as we start to get into this next hour together, um, I really want to stay grounded around that question and would love for you all to stay centered around that as we navigate this all together. And I'm going to kick us off um, with this quote. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take, as said by the great one, Wayne Gretzky. Or if there's any fans of The Office out there, you're probably going to try to convince me that this is actually a Michael Scott quote. And I suppose you wouldn't actually be wrong about that. As I spoke on a panel last year, in closing, the host asked us, what phrase do you live your life by? And this is what I said. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. And as the panel closed and I got to reflecting on that, I started to think, why do I embrace this notion? And I started to trace it back over time. And I realized it connected back to an internship I had in college at UC Davis. So here I worked for Aggie Pack, which is the largest student run spirit organization in the US. And we did all the marketing and in-game promotions for our athletic teams. And really the goal here was that I worked for three individuals who encouraged us to dream big. So they, for them, no idea was too outlandish. They would tell us, throw out your wildest and most creative ideas and let's see if we can make them happen, no matter how crazy they might seem. 
And they really discouraged us from self-limiting ourselves on um, talking ourselves out of a no that can't possibly happen before we even explore the potential of a yes. Now, let me tell you the craziest thing we did that year. We bought a fire truck. We bought this fire truck and we painted it with our school colors and we branded it with our school logo. And really this fire truck became almost like a secondary school mascot on campus. And we drove it onto the football field for pre-game pre festivities. And we'd stand on the back of that truck and launch into the crowd uh, t-shirts and tube socks and burritos out of slingshots. And the crowd absolutely went wild. And this was something that I was so proud to be a part of. And really, in the end, I was just so grateful for these three humans, Greg, Christina, and Brian, early in my formative years, who encouraged us all to dream big and to take those shots. Now, you're probably all wondering, okay, great, how does this tie to visual storytelling? And we're about to get there shortly. And as we start to get into it, I want to start by asking you all in um, the audience here, what does visual storytelling mean to you? When you hear those words, visual storytelling, what does that mean? Go ahead and drop it in the chat. Let's, let's see what comes to mind for some of you. Yeah, yeah, images of impact. Okay, that's great, Stephanie. Yes, videos or photos. Absolutely very common when it comes to visuals, Jose. Um, lots of videos, graphics. Yeah, Aggie, I love that. Anything that evokes emotions. Um, picture speaks a thousand words, Debbie. That's something I hear a lot, and I think there's so much truth to that. Um, wonderful. Good music, Jose. I am so with you. I love good music that really makes me feel something. I've never heard that one before, but that's a great way to think about it. So yeah, lots of people just lashing onto graphics, pictures, video, anything that's showing a story in some sort of visual representation. Okay, excellent. And now second question, um, and Jen is going to bring up this poll here. On a scale of one to five, I want to know how you feel about your relationship with visual storytelling. Five being the strongest, I am so happy with the amount of videos and photos I have to share. Four being close, but I'd maybe like to go an inch further. Three, maybe feeling stuck kind of in the same loop. Um, two, it's something top of mind that you want to start prioritizing. Or one, I don't even know where to begin. Okay, looks like a majority of you are falling into that four category, category, which is excellent. Probably you have a lot of ideas. Maybe you have some base collection of photos and videos that you share, but I would guess that there's always more you feel like you can collect. Um, and then also a really good distribution, three, two, and one. So this is super helpful to kind of get a little feel for who we have in the room here. Okay, excellent. Thank you everybody for sharing. All right. Well, I landed in nonprofit at Farmer Veteran Coalition. This is where I started my nonprofit career. It's an organization that helps veterans pursue careers in agriculture. And there, probably like a good handful of you here, I had the opportunity to write really powerful stories. These were stories of men and women who had um, served our country, or served the U.S., I should say, once in defending it, and now serving a second time in feeding their communities, growing food to feed their communities. And I started my storytelling journey there as really words on paper, words on a screen, um, anything that was representing these member stories, but these were all stories that I was writing on their behalf. And so after about a year of doing this, I felt like I wanted a little bit different way to experiment with storytelling. And that experiment, experimentation mindset that I had come to embrace at uh, my Aggie Pack internship started to creep back into my mind. And so I thought, what if I um, dabble with visual storytelling? And so that next spring, as we started giving out our grants, that next spring, as we started to give out our, um, our grants, every year we gave out about 100 different grants to farmer veterans in which we purchased for them directly a piece of farm equipment. And historically, we had done these announcements as simply a text listing of names on a web page of all the people that we were awarding this grant to. And so what I did that year to make it a little more visually stimulating was I decided to pull a slideshow together to supplement this text listing. And this became a really impactful way to show the faces of the community of all these awardees that we were giving this farm equipment to and pictures of what they themselves were growing all over the country. Now, how I did this was I went to these farmers' websites, I went to their social media pages, and I simply pulled a photo for each of them and built it into a YouTube slideshow. 
And while this was definitely a step better than simply a text listing, the challenge was it still wasn't our engaging our community directly or asking them to share through their own voice. They were simply these passive, passive subjects as I went to their websites and pulled content. So then um, ultimately, I kind of had this thinking of what would happen if I would allow our community to share through their own voices, through their own words, or even through their own photographs. Who here has tried this? Who's done this? Or maybe there are some of you who um, have dreams and ambitions of doing this, but haven't yet ventured into it. And what I'm going to do as we move forward now is um, I'd love to take you on a journey with me and walk back three years ago to 2021 when I really started to get into visual storytelling at Farmer Veteran Coalition and what happened once I did that. Um, yeah, Carla, I, I hear that. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a, um, a process of learning how to build a culture of storytelling. And, and there are definitely techniques we'll get into later in the webinar on what are ways we can really engage our community. So stay tuned for that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to share three examples of how I tried to do this at Farmer Veteran Coalition. And my hope is in doing this is that not only can you potentially see some own parallels in your work, but also that it really highlights for you my um, successes, my biggest challenges, and ultimately what I learned by doing all of this. Okay, so to start out, back in 2020, uh, 2021, it was the 20th commemoration of the 9-11 attacks. So for so many of the veterans we worked with, this day was the reason they chose to join the military. And for those who had already been serving, they, um, their whole trajectory in the military really changed that day, as you can imagine. And so this seemed like a perfect moment 20 years later to encourage them to reflect back on what that day meant to them, how pivotal it was, what impact it had on their lives. And so I put out a call to collect videos from our members in reflection, and I ended up getting um, seven videos in return. Now, Absolutely, those seven videos woven together made an incredibly impactful piece, especially because of the content of what those video messages were. However, we served 30,000 veterans all across the country. And so seven videos didn't feel completely representative of our membership on the whole. So fast forward two months later, we come to Veterans Day. And rather than using this day as a day to um, simply fundraise, we instead decided to use it as a day to celebrate all of our veteran members' collective time of service. So let me tell you what I was envisioning. Here's what I was thinking. I thought if I could collect photos of these veterans in their military uniform, one photo, um, I could make a really beautiful like web page collage of all these photos cascading down the page. If I could get something like 100 photos, I think it would make a really incredible reflection of all of these members who had served in all different eras, all different branches. But I almost started to talk myself out of it, thinking back to this video piece that didn't quite get the participation I wanted. I thought maybe this, these kind of asks are just too difficult for our community. Perhaps it's not something that they're particularly interested in engaging in, or maybe they just have too much going on in their farms that it's too hard to take time out of their day to do these kind of shares with us. So I almost talked myself out of it before I even tried it. But again, I went back to that mindset of don't talk yourself out of something before you give it a chance. And so I went ahead and I went forward and I put out this email request asking for a photo in military uniform. And anyone want to guess, um, take a guess in the chat, how many uh, photos that I, that I received? 1,000. Wow, Stephanie, you are ambitious. Love to see that. Okay, I got some hundred. Oh my gosh, 25,000, Robert. That is huge. That would be a majority of our membership, huh? Okay, hundreds. Yes, hundreds is definitely right in line. I personally was absolutely overwhelmed when 800 photos landed back in my inbox. Overwhelmed in the most wonderful of ways, thinking we now have 800 members that we get to collectively celebrate with this beautiful photo collage. Also, as you probably can imagine, 800 uh, completely overwhelming in the, in the sense that I now had to scramble to save them all, build them into a web page, and do that in a, in a couple short days' time in advance of Veterans Day. Um, but really, this just became such a wonderful way to highlight our members. And I started to think, what made this ask so much more um, successful than the first one? And when I realized what it was, it was, first of all, that this was so simple of an ask. 
it was simply probably all of these veterans had this photo on their phone at their fingertips at their disposal. And all they had to simply do was reply to my email, attach the photo and send it off to me. The other thing that was really, um, uh, I think, pertinent about it was that these members were so proud to share this, this photograph. Um, and yes, Natalia, to answer your question, I simply sent out a newsletter communication to all of um, our veteran members, which was a segment that we had in our, um, uh, we used constant contact and just asked them all to respond. And so as you can imagine, these were all just like pinging my inbox all day long for the next two days. And so it was definitely a lot of handholding to then save them out of the email, crop them and build them into a page. Um, so really the, the participation was beautiful, but there was something even more transformational that happened beyond that. So as these emails started to hit my inbox and these photos were attached to the email, I couldn't believe how many hundreds of these veterans actually wrote into the body of the email. Thank you for remembering us. Thank you for remembering us on Veterans Day, for recognizing what this day is supposed to be about, and for not forgetting us. This was a total turning point for me. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, and I couldn't believe in the sheer volume that I was hearing it to think that these veterans felt forgotten about. And on a day that was really supposed to recognize all of their years of service, for so many of them putting their life on the line, for many of them injuries that they might never fully recover from, for some of them seeing even their brothers and sisters in arms die before their very eyes, all the sacrifices their own families made. And to think after all that on a holiday that was supposed to give even a slight nod to a little bit of that, to recognize some form of that, to instead be reduced to discounts and sales and deals. So this became a turning point. This is when I really realized that visual storytelling was the voice that I owed these members that we worked with. Because really, isn't that the whole reason our mission exists? To be able to work with these people that we directly formed to help. And so this started a whole shift into what then became this idea of 360 degree stewardship for me. Now, to finish out that month, we launched into Giving Tuesday and we as a team decided to use Giving Tuesday as a day to share gratitude with our donors. I had just attended a conference a few months before that, and this whole idea was buzzing around between a lot of people of using Giving Tuesday as a day for gratitude to launch into an entire giving season. And so here's what our team thought. We thought, let's go ahead and approach some of those farmer veterans that we give this farm equipment grant to and ask them to take a little selfie video quickly on their farm with a piece of farm equipment there behind them and just explaining what it was that they were awarded, how it's made their operation more efficient, and ultimately a quick little message of thanks. Now, I'll tell you, I felt a little anxiety again around asking for some of these videos. I felt like I was really burdening these people who had some rigorous um, farm duties that they were constantly tended to. And I felt like I was taking time out of their day by asking them to stop and film a video with us. But once again, I was so pleasantly overwhelmed when dozens of them enthusiastically came back so willing to do this. And also, in addition to that, said they actually said thank you for the opportunity to say thank you. Again, couldn't believe. Thank you for the opportunity to say thank you. And so really, it became such a wonderful way to elevate voices of our community and show that impact to all the donors that we worked with. And ultimately, it makes me think of this great quote by Maya Angelou. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Clearly, these farmer veterans had a message they wanted to share with our community, and we just had to find the right moment to share it with them. So ultimately, all this to say, as I really dabbled in, in visual storytelling, it made me realize that these visual stories were not only a way to steward our donors alone, but really they were all about how to also steward our entire community on the whole, our beneficiaries, our constituents, all the people that we worked with. 360 degree stewardship. And I think we as a sector often get wrapped up in donor stewardship. We talk about it a lot and that is so wildly important, but we should never also forget about full community stewardship. 
So as we move forward here now in the rest of our time together, here's what, what I want to cover. I want to first talk about what exactly is this idea of 360 degree stewardship? Why does it matter? And then how do we approach it? And we'll look at that from this three prong approach of who can we collect stories from? What do we prompt them with? And how do we get participation? All right, let me know in the chat. Are you guys all still with me here? Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Catherine. Awesome. Okay, awesome. Love to hear it. Okay, so I found myself a couple years ago in, uh, gosh, love all the enthusiasm. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see so many faces joining in. So I found myself a couple years ago in San Antonio at the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference. And it was there by total chance that I happened to meet the Memory Fox team. And I was just wandering in the exhibit hall one day, walked up to the Memory Fox booth, had never heard of them. And when they showed me their tool that was all about how to collect grassroots, community-generated content from all the people that you work with, my jaw just hit the floor, as you probably can imagine. Um, I had no idea a tool like this existed. And all I could think was what a, what a game changer this absolutely would have been for me at Farmer Veteran Coalition. And especially on that day when 800 photos landed in my inbox. To go back to what you were asking, Natalia, it was a distribution through an email. They all came back via email and it was very tedious to save. So yes, all I can think of was what a big, big game changer this would have been. And I just couldn't believe that what I had been doing, very intentionally collecting videos and photos from my community, what I believed in so strongly, there was this great tool out there for. And the reason I tell you all of this is because I went home and a short month later, I actually joined the team at Memory Fox, which is where I am now. And now that I work with nonprofits every day to tell their own community stories, it's really given me a whole different perspective on what all visual storytelling can mean. You see, I think before I used to think about it as uh, what a lot of you said to start off our webinar here, um, images and videos, anything that kind of represented a story in some sort of visual form. But I often th thought about it as one individual representing their own journey through those photos and videos. But now I have had my eyes open to so many great ways that nonprofits are really creatively using visual stories to represent all facets of their mission. So what exactly is 360 degree stewardship? It is a holistic, inclusive approach towards building relationships with all members of your community and giving them opportunity to authentically share their voice and to listen intently when they do. Okay, and why? Why is this so important? So if any of you have ever heard uh, Dr. Bertrude Albert or Dr. Priscilla Zelaya, they're the, the founders of the nonprofit P4H Global, um, who works, they work in Haiti specifically. If any of you have ever heard them talk, you will understand why this is so critical. We'll have Jenna distribute the link to this little clip afterwards. I think it is so important for people to listen into what they had to share, but I'm basically going to summarize it for you so you get the gist of, of the two minutes of their talk that I pulled out to share with all of you. Basically, they talk about as the um, this earthquake, as many of us know back in 2010, this massive earthquake hit Haiti. And so many of the people they were working there with, immediately their thought was, let's start collecting clothing donations, shoes, any like kind of supplies we can send to these people in Haiti to help support them through this very devastating and challenging time. And they sent all these materials off to Haiti and the people they work with, with came back to them saying how difficult this made their livelihoods. And the reason was because a lot of these people that they had started their nonprofit to directly benefit, these were people who made their livelihood by creating clothes and selling it to all the members in their community or who created, who um, made shoes and sold it to the community members. And so by this nonprofit coming in and giving these donations to help support this relief effort, they were actually taking away the opportunity for these members they were actually trying to help um, by taking away their livelihoods. Thank you, Jennifer, for putting in that clip. Um, I'll let you all know the part that's really meaningful to listen to starts at the one minute mark. And so the, the biggest takeaway from that is how do we know what our community needs if we're not giving them a voice? And if we're not giving them a voice, are we really representing them? 
Conversations are how we move past assumptions, and we should absolutely use those conversations and those stories to guide our very moves. Because when we engage in this idea of 360 degree stewardship, we lift the voices not often heard. We encourage our community to share with us their needs, their hopes, and their dreams. And when they do that, that's when we really begin to understand the true needs of our community. And what this does is it allows us to build an ecosystem of interconnectedness and then ultimately inspire more giving through tangible impact. And it allows us to work with our community better and more fully. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we actually approach this idea? And what I'm going to do um, in these, in kind of our next time together here is go through some ideas to talk about and maybe start you thinking on how can we encompass, encompass this whole idea of using visual storytellings to accomplish this mission of 360 degree stewardship. And then I'm going to highlight three organizations that I've seen do this really well to give you some actual examples to see how this can work. And then for the remainder of our time together, we'll get really tactical in terms of how you actually can go out into your own communities and do this. And we'll do a little bit of a workshopping experience. Okay, so here are some ways you can think about honoring your community. You can do this through education. So actually doing some sort of community interviews, maybe you go to field experts in your arena. Maybe you go to trusted doctors that you work with and you ask them to share some pieces that help you actually perform your mission and educate all the people that you work with. Same thing, you can approach your staff members, team members, actually ask them to share um, in a little video snippet, what kind of services you offer people, what benefits you provide. And that becomes a really great way to create these little video roll-ups to showcase all the different elements of your work. Um, but rather than just sending people to a web page with lots of text written on it, which sometimes can be a lot to trudge through, um, you're doing it in a really engaging way because video highlights your personality and it shows the faces of all the people in your community. Program impact is an excellent way to do this showcase as well. So approach anybody who participates in your programs, have them share testimony of what this program has done for them, how it's impacted them, or go to the volunteers who actually help you run these programs and have them share why it's so important that this work continues. Same thing for grant impact. I've seen that also happen with organizations who get grants go out and do the work, and then they actually collect some videos to go back to the, the grantor who's given them that funding and share what it is they've been able to do by getting that grant money. Volunteer work is an excellent way to highlight um, your mission. So if you have any days where your volunteers are actually going out into the field and performing work, perfect opportunity to capture some of that in action. Same thing if... Um, you just very simply want to reach out to your volunteers and get their whys. Why is it that your mission is so meaningful to them? Why do they choose to engage with you? Events also, again, um, especially if you think about in-person events, another perfect moment to capture some of that video footage in action, do some event roll-ups of photo and event highlights. Scholarship stories, if you're an organization that gives out scholarships, what a perfect way to engage people either on the front end of them looking forward to their aspirations of what this scholarship might help them achieve or accomplish, or looking back at time if they've already used it, what they were actually able to do with that scholarship award. Anniversaries, I love. This is such a perfect moment uh, as a way to capture memories and moments and reflections of the past to really show in your history how far has your organization come already through some of these um, community member reflections. And then also you can look ahead to the future of everything that you hope to accomplish in the next however many years. And then lastly, donor stories. Every unique donor in your community likely has some sort of origin story with your organization. So asking them why they give, what inspired their gift today, why is your mission meaningful to them? But I think it's important to keep in mind that you don't necessarily know what storylines you have to share um, or what those stories are until you start to ask for them. Okay, so now that we have some of these in mind, let's look at three organizations that are doing this really well. So first one I want to highlight is Wreaths Across America. Probably some of you are familiar with them. 
a very large part of their programming is one day um, in December, they have volunteers all across the country go out to uh, um, cemeteries where they lay wreaths on the headstones of fallen service members. And this is a really high volume um, event in terms of participation because they have volunteers going off to cities all across the United States participating in this. Now, last December, they were actually able to collect over 8,000 pieces of content on that one day alone that they now use in all of their marketing materials all, long, all year long. But even more than that, what's really fantastic about this is this became a way for them to prompt their community and ask who it is that these people are going out to honor the memory of and what it means to them to be able to do that. And so what a great way for these volunteers to reflect on somebody they, somebody that they lost that were um, just a very pivotal part of their lives and really pay tribute to their memory. Okay, second organization, um, and this one was all about a great educational campaign. So the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, this was back during the height of COVID, some of those early days of COVID when there was a lot of uncertainty going around. And they realized that many of the people in their community that they worked with had lots of questions around both the, um, the virus and the vaccine. And so what they did is they launched a really phenomenal educational campaign where they had, um, they approached the youth, the kind of middle school age kids in their community who are the ones who had a lot of these questions. And they asked them to just simply take their device, film themselves asking that question they had. And then Urban League took all of those question videos and sent them over to trusted doctors in their community and asked those doctors to film videos, uh, sharing their expertise, their knowledge. And then Urban League went ahead and took all of those videos um, of the, the questions and the answers, and they wove them together into one large video piece where they then published it on YouTube. And this became a really easy way for them to do a distribution and educate over a thousand people far and wide all at once. And what was really wonderful about this is I think it was just such a great way to use visual stories um, and turn it into an educational campaign. Now, they absolutely could have gone out and um, distributed this as like a typed up FAQ sheet PDF that they just distributed. But it became so much more meaningful to share it in the own um, in the voices of the community members themselves and highlighting some of the faces of the people who were asking these questions and sharing these answers directly. All right, and the third one that I want to highlight here, this is the Community Foundation of Martin St. Lucie. Um, one of the things they do is they give out college scholarships to high school students. And what's really great about um, what they did here is they basically took some of their most compelling testimony, they turned it into this story page, and they sent this impact back to the partner who actually funds this scholarship program for them. But not only that, this was a great way for these um, these uh, students to do a little bit of self-reflection back on one year into this scholarship, what have I been able to do um, as a benefit of it? And looking forward, they were able to share all of their aspirations going forward for the coming years of the rest of the scholarship. So really by giving our community a platform and their own voice, we are helping them understand and refine their own story. Because after all, stories are more than just stories, very simply. Stories serve lots of purposes. Stories are memory aids, their instruction manuals, and their moral compasses. Okay, so now that we have some of these ideas um, in terms of what this can look like, how we can go out and solicit these stories, now the question is, how do you actually go and, out and do this in your own community? And so what I want to highlight now is my three-pronged approach that's going to help you approach this in um, this like breakdown way of the who, the what, and the how. So who can you solicit stories from? What can you actually prompt them with? And then, of course, probably the question that it weighs most heavily on a lot of people's minds, how do I actually get um, content? How do I actually get people to engage and participate? OK, and so in order to do this, this is going to become a little bit interactive. And um, in order to make this come full circle, I'm going to need a little bit of engagement here from all of you. And it's only going to work if we all do this together. All right. So what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, is grab your phone, scan this QR code, and what I want you to answer is very simply, why are you passionate about your mission? 
Or if you want, you could just simply state what your mission is in one sentence. Um, and Carly, thank you. I forgot to introduce her at the top of the hour, but Carly is our Rockstar Marketing Manager, and um, she is helping out in the chat. Definitely will um, drop some links that are helpful. And also, if any of you have questions, probably Carly will be busy answering them in the chat as well. Um, but very simply, I want you to go ahead, scan this QR code, forward, um, fast forward to the screen where you actually see the video record option. And super short, I don't want this to be long. I want it to be quick and easy, 10 seconds or less. Go ahead and tell me why are you passionate about your mission? And I um, will give you a couple minutes to do this. I'm actually going to scan it as well. I'm going to put myself on mute so I can submit my own video. And then this will become relevant towards the end of my presentation. All right. So um, I'm going to put myself on mute here and I'll let you all tackle this as well. All right. Well, hopefully everybody's getting close. Love it, Carolyn. Awesome. Thanks everybody for so much great audience participation. This is going to be fun to come back to, and we will come back to this at the end. Um, so continue to feel free to submit. If you haven't finished yours yet, there's definitely still time to do that. But in the meantime, I want to go back to what I promised you all on the who, the what, and the how. So let's start with the who. And I think it's really important for us to stay centered as we think about who all can we collect from um, in terms of stories in our community to think about all the different perspectives out there that can highlight and shine a different little piece of light on our mission. So here are some examples of ideas of people that you might approach in your community who have a different piece of the story to share. So maybe you go to your founders. Certainly your founders have a great story to share about why they started the organization. Volunteers. Maybe you approach some um, participants who are a part of your programs. If you give out scholarship, absolutely scholarship awardees. Donors, absolutely. I think that's probably a big one for all of us. Um, family members are a great like secondary extension of a lot of people that we work with. Case managers are an option. And then even field experts and doctors, kind of like we were looking at with that Urban League example. Okay, so now what we're going to do is um, I want to workshop this a little bit. So what I'm going to ask all of you to do is either on a piece of paper or whatever Word document you're typing on, wherever you're taking your notes, go ahead and jot down three different subgroups within your community that you could approach to collect stories from. And it can be any of the three that you see here. Um, it could be three ideas that kind of come to you separately that are tied to your own community. So go ahead. I'll give you about 30 to 45 seconds to make note of those. Um, and then we'll move on to the next part. Yeah, Sue, that's great. Volunteers, donors, and program participants. Three really, really great perspectives. Okay. All right. Hopefully everybody got their three down there. Um, if not, continue to think about it. Um, certainly this isn't like something that's just confined to this session. This is something I hope you walk away thinking about. Okay. So now the next piece, this is all about the what. So in terms of what you're going to prompt people with, Simple and specific is what we have found to work best. So very specifically, helping people think uh, about pinpointing a certain moment in time or a feeling or some sort of memory, um, prompting them with a question that's going to really target them onto that kind of idea, or even starting them with the beginning of a statement and allowing them to fill the rest in in their own words. You'd be really amazed what some people start to share with you that you had a, no idea were stories to uncover in your own community. And so what I mean by simple and specific, or really by specific, is posing those great questions to help you steward those great stories. So instead of something really open-ended and kind of vague, like tell us your story, that might be hard for somebody to know what it is you're asking about. Try instead something like, how did our organization help you overcome the challenges you were facing? Or instead of tell us about the volunteer work you do, I, as a volunteer, might not know exactly what you're getting at with that question. Try something a little more targeted, like tell us about the first time you volunteered with us. How did it make you feel? That's something that I can really like viscerally go back to and, and um, plant myself in that feeling. Okay, so as we go back to those um, different personas we were looking at on the Who screen, here are some potential questions you can ask some of those people. So for founders, what was the need you identified when you started the organization? Volunteers, ask them what one moment of volunteering sticks out most for them. For any of your program participants, you could certainly prompt them with the beginning of this statement. The most important thing I've learned or the best skill I've built from this program is, and let them fill in the rest. 
scholarship awardees. Because of this scholarship, I'll be able to. And think of, of what are the possibilities they could share with you there. For donors, very simply, what inspired your gift today? It's a simple question, but it can uncover some really powerful history. Family members, ask them why this mission has transformed their own lives. For case managers, you can have them share their favorite mission moment from the year. And then approach your field experts, your doctors, and have them share what that top, top issue is currently affecting the community that you serve. Okay, so now, same thing. Let's go ahead. Um, we'll take a, about a minute to workshop this one as well. What I want you to do is think about going back to that list of those three personas that you previously identified. Go ahead and write out one call to action that you could prompt each of them to be able to collect some really meaningful testimony. And if um, any of you are feeling brave enough, just like some of you already did there, which was great to see those, those three sections you identified within your community, um, and if anybody is willing to share who they're reaching out to and what question they might prompt with, go ahead and drop it in the chat. Um, it's sometimes really helpful for us to just learn from each other what kind of communi uh, communications and questions we're posing to our own community. Oh, that's a great one, Catherine. Thinking about the fir first moment you truly felt like you belonged. My goodness, what wonderful testimony that might elicit. Yeah, love to hear that, Lair. What one moment stands out in your mind as a volunteer in this organization? I bet you um, you will be surprised at once what some people might share with you that you had no idea these were moments that meant so much to the people in your community. Awesome. All right. Well, let me go ahead. Um, I'm going to fast forward here to the last one, the how. Probably the question that's burning on a lot of your minds, how do we actually get people to engage with us? And so on the next slide, I'm going to spill a lot of our secrets for success, success with this. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to go through these really quickly, but um, I can definitely deep dive on any of those for those of you who might want to think about these a little more deeply. Just connect with me afterwards and I'll give you some of these tips um, in a little bit expanded capacity. So tell a diverse story like we were just talking about. Think of all the different perspectives, perspectives in your community who can lend their lens onto the work that your mission does. Simplify, keeping that question very simple and straightforward. Um, don't make it overwhelming for people. And tied to that is number three, keep your ask short. People don't like to share long content. People also don't like to consume long content. So it's great to let your community know 10 to 20 seconds, even 30 seconds. That's a great time frame for sharing. Probably the biggest thing I could say is encourage authenticity. So um, we know that people these days create that, that raw content, raw video content is king. This does not have to be something that's overly produced and your community should know that. So giving them the chance to share with all the ways that they talk, let them say those ums and ahs, let them correct themselves. That's how we as humans speak. That's what makes you relatable to your audience and builds trust. Anytime you can include an example of a video when you send out your ask for more, that helps people see what it is you're looking for. And definitely when you do those asks, bake them into all your existing touch points where your community is already most actively engaged with you, whether that's email newsletters, whether that's in-person gatherings or social media. Um, if you have the opportunity real time when people are gathered together to capture some testimonials and footage, that's a great way to really um, get that authentic emotion. And then think about having multiple touch points. So just because you ask somebody once doesn't mean you are asking them in the best moment for them. We're all busy. We get distracted a lot. We have a lot on our plates. So don't be afraid to go back and ask for something a second time. Um, and then including a deadline and coming back to somebody at the end to show them their full circle impact of what you were able to do with their video, all the places you shared it is really going to help you get that full circle buy-in for the next time you ask them for more content shares. Okay, so now um, on that note of full circle buy-in, I want to come back and show all of you who participated here um, with our video ask what we were able to create together. All right. Okay, so here is our donor box gallery of impact. So look at all these really wonderful missions we have represented in this room together today. So many things we could learn from each other. So um, in the essence of time, I'm not going to click into play any of these, but uh, Jenna will absolutely distribute to this 
this link to you all afterwards and some follow-up materials and you can click in and hear all the wonderful reasons people are so passionate about their mission. The who was all of you, these webinar attendees, the um, the what was prompting you very simply with something simple as share what you're, why you're passionate about your mission. Um, but ultimately it let us get some really positive testimony. And then my how was doing it all together and telling you this is going to require group share. So I know we're just about at time here, Jenna. Um, I want to make sure we have time for any questions. I will. Um, one question that comes up very often that we like to preempt is people talking about what happens if I have sensitive stories that I need to be really cognizant of. And I'm sure probably many of you in your own communities have those stories. So um, or that question, I should say. And so um, Carly will drop a link. We have all sorts of resources we've started developing around ethical storytelling, one of them being a report that we just recently put out. Um, and actually, it's perfect timing because Carly is doing a deep dive into some of the high-level takeaways tomorrow on a webinar for that, um, that report. So if anybody wants to join that webinar, or even if you can't join live, um, you can register and we'll get you the recording. Um, just a really great way to consider some of those ethical storytelling ideas that are really important for stewarding our communities. Over on the right, that goodie bag, this is like chock full. Can you guys see the screen now? Jenna, can you see that? Okay, awesome. That link will take you to all sorts of excellent resources. That ethical storytelling report I mentioned, um, tips on how to collect great video story stories, even um, Canva templates to help you with your some of your work that you might be doing. So definitely make sure you grab that and um, utilize anything that's really helpful to all of you in your great story, story collection efforts. And I just want to say, I hope you go forward to experiment um, in your own communities. And I really hope you all have your own fire truck moment. This could have been a three hour workshop. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Natalie, this has been so great. And all rest assured, we'll share uh, this presentation. And Natalie, um, I'm not sure if we can link the slides or not. If you'd like to share the slides, um, we can drop that in the YouTube description as well, uh, along with this goodie bag and a couple of extra uh, resources as well. Now, I know we're already at the top of the hour, but we do have a few questions to answer. And before we do that, I uh, would like to point you towards a helpful resource as well, which is our Donor Box YouTube channel. And it's just such a great knowledge base for fundraising tips and how to guides, nonprofit best practices, podcast episodes, webinars like this one um, that are all led by industry in, uh, thought leaders and influencers like Natalie here. Uh, so I'll go ahead and launch the link to our YouTube channel as well. And uh, go ahead and subscribe and hit that notification bell icon so that you don't miss out on any of the great content, including this video that will be uploaded uh, by tomorrow or the next day. Uh, and now all, if you have to log off, um, thank you so much for joining us. And for those of you who do have questions, uh, we'll go ahead and just answer the few that are in the chat now. How does that sound, Natalie? Do you have a few? Sounds questions? great. Let's do it. All right. Uh, I love this question. This was such a great one. And um, we talk about animal charities all the time. So this question is, what happens if my story or the stories that we have to tell are about animals and not just people? Yeah, the, I think there's a couple different ways you can approach this. And, and almost like you have an advantage of being able to tell even more perspectives as a result. So um, certainly, even if your mission is about um, or your focus is animals, there's still is some layer of human involvement, right? There has to be humans involved in some capacity. So you can tell really great stories um, of the humans who maybe benefit from working with these animals, tell the story through their lens. But also, I think you can get really creative in, like, I've seen some organizations who do have, who work with sensitive populations and have to be very cognizant of not sharing um, an individual's details or even putting their face up on a screen. And so they tell the perspective, like I've heard, for example, um, survivors of domestic violence, they tell the perspective from the bag that's packed in the closet, ready to move on to a new location. Or we've heard, and this is actually comes from the ethical storytelling report, the example of um, for like food banks or organizations that work with um, food insecurity, actually telling it from the perspective of a delivery truck moving from point A to B making deliveries. I think you could really easily do the same thing through an animal's perspective. And what a fun way to get creative with your storytelling. 
I think that is so spot on. Thank you for that. Now we have a couple of people in the chat asking how they can learn how to use Memory Fox and the storytelling as a part of their organization. You shared a bit already. We see the website on the screen. Anything else to add to that, Natalie? Any uh, use cases or organizations that you could share have used Memory Fox that um, people can take a look at? Yeah. And in fact, if you head to our website, memoryfox.io, um, under the resources tab, there's a whole listing of success stories. And this has been so fun to share um, with our entire community and with the whole entire nonprofit sector, because it really gives people great ideas for how can I start to tell my own community stories in ways I ne maybe never had considered before. Um, so that's a great thing to check out. But definitely um, within this goodie bag, there's a link if anybody's interested in just kind of brainstorming, like, what are the opportunities that you all have the chance to share stories um, from your own community angle? There's a there's time there that you can just book to talk with one of our storytelling experts. And we love this is what we live and breathe daily for. So we love to talk storytelling and we're always happy to kind of deep dive into that with you. That is absolutely perfect because I do see some questions here based around very specific missions. And what I can say is reach out to Natalie, book some time, connect with the Memory Fox team and um, work on that one-on-one -on -one conversation, right? And see what you can dream up together. So um, I want to be super respectful of everybody's time. And again, we want to thank you so much for joining us today. I love learning from you. Natalie, I, um, again, I just adore you completely. I love the work that you all are doing through Memory Fox. And uh, by the way, my quote, the quote that I live by is, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. And I think this applies very well to the storytelling as well, right? You didn't know that these people had so much to share and say within the organization that you're working with and you were flooded with these positive responses. So uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And if you don't ask the, the answer is always no. So I'll thank you so much again for joining us and Natalie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. You're the most fabulous host. Appreciate you and your team so much. Right back at you. All right, everyone go off and have a wonderful week and keep an eye out in your email inbox uh, for the recording and the resources. Have a great one.